Thank you very much, Derek. We're coming at you live from Porcupine Butte and Keeley FM Radio. Today I'd like to very warmly welcome to Keeley Stephen Lewis Simpson. He's originally from Scotland. He was here a while back with a movie called Res Bomb. He's back with uh, actually his fifth movie. First three he did in Scotland. And then he did Res Bomb, and now this is his fifth movie, um, A Thunder Being Nation, the Oglau Lakota of the Pine Ridge Reservation. Um, he's just releasing it now. It's been available around Pine Ridge, and it will be in other locations here and around the country. I'd like to very warmly welcome to Keeley, Stephen Lewis Simpson. Good afternoon, sir. Hi, Tom. Good to be here. How are you? Very good. Always good when I'm here. I don't like it here today. Or what? Well, I keep coming back. Actually, I, it's more than that. I love it here. I have uh, so many great friends now here, and uh, I don't think there's anywhere else in the world where I laugh as much as I do when I'm here. Well, that's, they tell me it's a survival school, or a survival skill <laughs> to be able to laugh and have some humor. Um, you were here when with Resbaum? Uh, Resbaum. I guess I took it out here 2008 or 9, I think it was in the summer. No, 2009 in the summer I came and did some screenings and that's when we spoke about it. And you, you had completed it when? Um, it premiered in 2008 at a film festival, the Montreal World Film Festival, and the festivals after that, and then got its DVD release at that point. Okay. Yeah. So what came out of that is this DVD that you have out now? Well, it actually was more the other way around. I started shooting the documentary first, um, but it was just sort of a marathon project. I mean, in reality, I'm a fiction filmmaker principally. And, um, I mean, this all started really back in the summer of 99 when I first came out here. There was a, a ghost shirt being repatriated from a museum in Scotland that was uh, had been there since 1891 and had been taken from the Wounded Knee Massacre site. And, you know, I had been building up an interest in, in the area up to that point when I saw it was being repatriated. I just, light bulb went off in my head, I was going to follow it here. And, you know, within sort of minutes of hitting Pine Ridge, I found myself meeting some fascinating people and sort of extraordinary things and started covering things at that point. And then people started asking me to film various other things and it, it just kept expanding from there. Uh, but my you know, day job, so to speak, was making movies, so I was making movies back in the UK through that time. And, you know, because of that, you know, the documentary would would sit on the table in between making all those projects. So, you know, it can take two, three years to make a movie, and then, you know, I'd be coming back and forth in between. Um, and then there was a point in 2005 when I was looking to make another movie, and it was a story that I'd written for Scotland and was planning on doing in Scotland. Uh, but I didn't want to shoot another movie there, and I love the idea of shooting a movie here. And so that's where Rasbaum came about, and I set that here. So, you know, I, actually a lot of what you see in the documentary had already been shot by the, the point that uh, I made Rasbaum. But from those of you that will see the documentary, uh, you know, one of the things about it is it covers a tremendous amount of ground. And, you know, this sort of from the origin story through a lot of, you know, history up to, to contemporary issues today. And, you know, it was amassed from about 70 hours of, um, you know, original recordings and interviews where people talked about pretty much anything they wanted. I didn't have, a, you know, my own agenda in terms of subject. And it was just a huge task distilling that down into, you know, a tangible narrative. And, um, you know, so it was sort of that thing. I dipped in and out of it in between doing those things and doing West Bond and whatever else. And, and your your goal for this, I mean, you, you started off and the, the premise was, what, from the very beginning till now? I mean, you wanted to talk oh, with Manobla Lakota or what? No, I mean, at the beginning there was, you know, I literally had no thought or idea or agenda at that point. It, it, it really all happened organically, step by step. And, you know, it wasn't really until I started assembling it, sort of about halfway through the journey of it, and... You know, I, I mean, literally, I would sit down in front of people, and because, you know, I never, I didn't go in with a list of questions. I was interested in what people had to say rather than 
what I had to put on it. So I end up with so much random things about it that, right. that really, when I when I thought about it at the beginning, what it, what shape it was going to take, it was hard to conceive because I had so much material. So I would just go through every interview and isolate everything they were talking about. If they were talking about housing or Wounded Knee 1890 or boarding schools or whatever, I would just put everything into the individual subject matter and then working on them individually. And then it sort of assembled itself in a way. Um, and it was just kind of for me to listen to the content and to sort of truly appreciate the form that it was, you know, that was most natural for it to take. Um, I mean, at one point it was so just so big, the amount of material. I was thinking, you know, I might have to split it into two documentaries, one historical and one contemporary, and sort of as a two-parter, but I, I did manage to keep whittling it down to sort of a manageable length as a single documentary. And this movie's how long? It's 86 minutes. Okay. Um, it, is it harder to do a piece like that where you really don't have it thought out? Of, I mean, most people kind of don't fly by the seat of their pants. I mean, they kind of have a plan, and mm -hmm. they think it out, and so that they're questions are really kind of focused on, you know, adding some flesh or material to that plant, to, mm -hmm. the, to the kind of bones, you know, kind of a skeleton that you have, and mm -hmm. you're adding to it. So is it harder to do it this way? In editing terms, it's vastly harder. <laughs> it's, you know, it, it's it's a real, uh, just of the scale of it, I mean, it would, it would take about, you know, two weeks just to listen to the material once, you know, and then, you know, to be able to break it down. Um, but th I think the important thing the other way around on it is, and I think one of the things that distinguishes the documentary from others, is that I wasn't interested in hearing what I wanted to hear. I was interested in hearing what people had to, wanted to tell. And I think that was the core thing with the documentary, was appreciating the fact that, you know, there was, you know, there was an extraordinary world and community and history and all those other things here, but that you know, the local voice wasn't particularly being heard. I mean, and, and often when you see things editorially put together, it's very much from a singular kind of perspective. And, you know, you can do something contemporary, and, you know, it can have a lot of value, and you can do something historical, and it can have a lot of value, but, you know, it's sort of one of the things when you really understand things here, you appreciate how connected they are. And, 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 and I don't mean even just in terms of you know, positive connections to past culture, but also, you know, how people are handcuffed to other parts of their history, whether it be boarding schools or other things like that, and how things have not naturally been allowed to evolve. And, you know, I think without understanding, you know, issues like some of the historical issues, particularly regarding education, then it's hard for people to understand why, you know, there are some of those contemporary you know, conflicts today, the fact that, you know, you now have sort of the first real generation of parents who look at education in a different way to people, say, 30, 40, 50 years ago who had, had boarding school experience. So to have that, that journey from past to present, I thought, was really crucial. So you're releasing it here mm -hmm. originally, okay, it's being released here. Is, is the piece for Oglala Lakota? Is it for people who are not from here and to give them a sense of what Oglala Lakota is? I mean, how do you see it? Well, I, I think, you know, for me as a filmmaker, it's the narrative speaks to you and you, you, you do it the way it's meant to be told and then you put it out to the world and it's for them to decide um, in many ways. But I, I, I think the most, my most important thing with this was that a lot of people from many different sides of the community here, for some reason, you know, trusted me into their, into their space. And this wasn't a documentary where I'd roll up and say, you know, I want to film right now, and, you know, we'd set it up in a particular mm -hmm. way. Invariably, you know, often I'd stay with people, and then, you know, when the time was right, it sort of happened very organically. And so through that level of, of you know, faith and trust, it was a very important for me to honor that. So that my first priority is making sure that you know, the people who are in it watch it and go, yeah, that's how, that, you know, that's the context in which I'd said it and so on. And, you know, last summer I came out here when it was pretty advanced work cut and I screened it to a lot of the key participants that I could find just to make sure that editorially they were satisfied with it because, you know, people's words can be edited 
into a completely different context, sure. but you know, the, there's a trust. There's a trust, yeah. And and so for me, it was very important to honor that. And the reactions were extraordinary I and mean, very moving, actually. And and um, you know, it was wonderful. But the only it was funny. The only things editorially that were requested to be changed were nothing relating to the context of facts as such. But it was. You know, oh, you know that story where I talk about my cousin and such and such and her education. Well, I'd rather you didn't mention it, just so I don't want her seeing me talking about her telling that story. You know, you know, it was all kind of really kind of individual human personal, things. personal, personal yeah. yeah. So you know, whenever anyone requested something like that, it was out. You know, uh, just because, again, the, the respect factor was very big in it. I mean, I think um, from the local perspective. Um, I think in some respects, if, if people here can feel like, you know, they have maybe someone from overseas they become friendly with who passes through or whatever else, for them to have something to say, well, actually, you should watch this because this kind of really summarizes what we feel or where we come from or whatever. And for them to feel that this piece, you know, encapsulates th those things, then that would be something I'd be very proud of. But for local people, one of the things that was very important to me was that through the journey of making the documentary, I uncovered a lot of things um, in terms of other source documentaries that I have clips from or things like that. And also there were a lot of really interesting things in the interviews that didn't make the cut. And so I wanted to make sure that there was a big resource there beyond the documentary. So I've, I've put two editions of the DVD together, one of which is a special edition with one a single disc with four hours of extras. And there's an ultimate edition with 10 hours of extras on two discs. And that's got a lot of extended interviews. Particularly, I focused on people who passed on um, since filming, people like uh, Johnson Holy Rock, Harvey White Woman, and Russell Loudhawk, and Claudia Ironhawk. And, and also, I put in um, uh, Larry Bowden, when he was the superintendent of the BIA, gave me a really kind of interesting 100 minutes or so interview, which he wasn't allowed to give. Uh, without Washington's approval and without them pre-approving every answer, but he did it anyway. And, you know, I mean, I know everyone is, is you know, the BIA, there's, everyone has their, their views and all those other things, and, and what was really interesting about this, and I thought was a really interesting value in it, he talked a lot about the obstacles he had with Washington. And so I thought that was kind of an interesting insight. A lot of people would like to have been in that room, so I put it on the disc. And one of the things which was fascinating, for example, was, you know, he talked about meeting with his superiors and saying that he should have his uh, job title changed from superintendent to ambassador, you know, which was kind of interesting. You know, it's kind of interesting in terms of his mindset. Um, but also within the archive, you know, there was footage I found about a year ago that I never even heard of the incident that it was filmed of. In 1913, two troops of the 7th Cavalry returning to Pine Ridge uh, with this guy, I think Wanamaker was his surname, he was traveling the country, going to different reservations and sort of forcing down their throats a particularly grand flag raising ceremony in these huge stars and stripes. And, you know, to see these, these elders there witnessing, you know, being literally, you know, opposite them, this huge troop, of, two troops of cavalry, was just very, very powerful and extraordinary footage. And the, it was a seven minute long sort of short documentary film in 1913 filmed of it, which I used a little bit of in the documentary, but it was so powerful I put the whole thing on the, the extra features disc. Um, and, you know, that was something I never knew had happened. I think, you know, I spoke to a lot of people and they weren't aware of it, you know, to think 23 years after Wounded Knee. Um, so, you know, it's, it's it's sort of the thing. I'm proud of the documentary, but I'm very proud of the whole the whole package because I think it's something that, you know, for people who are really wanting to learn a lot further beyond. And the great thing about seeing full interviews is, you know, you can also appreciate, um, you know, exactly how and the depth to which people were going into certain things that you can, you know, in a quickly edited, you know, documentary. Uh, when you look back, what are the strengths of this piece? On the, the strengths of the documentary? Yeah, of this documentary. I think it's um, truly authentic in terms of the situations. I mean, what I tried to do was, um, you know, interviews weren't 
particularly managed. I mean, it was like if we if if someone put a seat in the kitchen, we just started rolling. Um, and it was very conversational, you know, it was only me that was there. And I think the people from the outside that watch it end up with a much deeper connection with people here because of that. I mean, they get all the context, and they get all the information, but, but people really feel an emotional connection watching it with, with the individuals. And it's, and it's a very broad cross-section of people here. And I think one of the other things which is interesting about it is, you know, we, you know, you know, we know how, you know, a lot of people struggle to get along here from different sides of political divides and all those other sorts of things. And, you know, a lot of those different people are in the documentary. And what is striking about it when you listen to so many hours of these people talking is about how, I, mean, I think it would be hard pressed to go to many communities where in a sense, people politically agree on so much and yet struggle to get along on those issues politically. Um, I mean, it really is people were speaking with one voice consistently in the documentary. Um, and, and I mean, and in a genuine way, because you know, the issues are the issues. Um, and it's sort of, a, I think that's sort of one of the things with my years on, you know, Pine Ridge and, and you know, I don't know, I've, I've a, I've had a particularly wonderful experience here over the years, but it's sort of the thing that, that I, I think about with it is, in some respects, is if, um, I mean, I, I do love it here, but if everyone here treated each other the way I get treated here, oh, this place would be beyond incredible. Because, you know, wherever I go, I just get treated miraculously well here by people. And, and um, you know, it just sort of gets frustrating when so many people who I care deeply about and are wonderful people, and they don't get on with some of the other people that I get on great with and are wonderful people and and you know and, and that's the sort of sad thing when you're contextually putting together this whole journey through this documentary and people are talking about a lot of the problems and in some respects when people are talking about colonization and all those things and you're appreciating the fact that it's this conflict this internal conflict that's going on right now is you know in a sense the greatest you know, success continuing through from the colonization in a sense that it's it's just being kind of left to themselves and and you know it, it, I think that's the thing that if if I could ask for anything here to see in the future is for because if people can get along then you can truly start to build because the individual character here is just incredible you know to an outsider like me so that's the strength that you see from this piece. What about areas? Do you feel that there's weak areas, or do you feel that you'd like to have done a better job with any particular area? Well, part of the reason it took so long to finish was be, it was kind of technically done in a reasonably ramshackle way, in the sense that you know when I first came out here, I, my equipment was pretty simple and all those sorts of things, and so I. I cover things any which way that I could and then a lot of work in post-production sort of fixing that, fixing bad sound and all those sorts of things. Um, you know, I think if if I started doing it today, started filming everything today, in some respects I think it would be very different um, because, you know, my connection with, you know, has my connections and everything have expanded so much. Um, but, you know, in some respects I think that you know, there's a little bit of the rawness that comes through it that I think makes it effective in a way as well. And, um, you know, but the other thing was that my, what, I had a certain rules with this, and I'm not a big fan of creatively going into something with, with rules, but, you know, one of them was uh, narratively, in terms of when I was talking with people, was I wasn't going to force the issue. And, you know, the funny thing is, you know, I have this section on boarding schools where, for example, people talk about their experiences. And, you know, so everything in there is what people chose to tell me about it. Um, and, you know, the more time I spend in Indian country, the more horrific the stories you hear of individuals going through boarding schools. And, you know, in some respects, I think that the section that I have there almost doesn't carry the weight of what a lot of people went through. So in some respects, I think it's kind of a reasonably average experience. It doesn't go into the corners of the extremes of it, which in some respects makes me feel that the system got off quite lightly with it. Um, but 
at the same time, it fits within my rules of it, which was, you know, I, I wouldn't go to anyone and say, take me to the person who had the worst experience you know of in, in boarding schools. And, and that's it went with every issue within it. There wasn't a single person who I went, I said, you know, I want to speak to somebody who went through this or that. And um, So if somebody talks about something extreme that had happened in their lives, and there's a couple of really personal stories within it, they entirely chose to go there themselves. Um, which I think is important, you know, is appropriate because, um, you know, when somebody's going into a deeply personal space, it, you know, for me, it entirely should be their choice, and they should, I don't want to see anyone pressured into that sort of thing. You know, there's, there's. I remember watching an interview with a documentary filmmaker, and they were talking about techniques, and they said, you know, I always have the camera on my lap, so if I'm talking to somebody and they say something amazing, I can just press record and. They won't know I'm filming, and I can get this great material and all that. You know, and from a narrative standpoint, I can understand their satisfaction in doing that. But that totally broke my rules, which was everyone had. You know, they kind of had to request me to say, you know, okay, let's let's go with this, because um, the you know there was a documentary that happened when I was in the room with a camera not running that would have been much more. Um, sensational in a way. I mean, real, but some of the stories that, but, but the thing is that's in a private space and it's not my job to, to convey that. I'm not that kind of filmmaker. And I think the net result of that is that, you know, that's why it has the, the feel that it does is because, you know, people trusted me. You know, they trusted me not to do that. So, I mean, it has to be a challenge to come in. You're from Scotland, to come in. and. Try and tell the story of a lot of local people through their own words, mm -hmm. and knowing full well that there'll always be people out there kicking about it, and saying, mm -hmm. "Well, that's not the, that's not really what happened, or that's not the real story." And how, how much time would you say you spent on this? Oh, I mean, editing it, I probably spent about three years, two and a half, three okay. years. And you started. You but I started shooting it in '99. The first, the, the earliest, earliest footage in it goes back to Camp Justice in '99. Okay. But I made three other movies in the meantime, so it, it took the back seat through quite a bit of it. Right. So it's a thread that wove through from '99 until yeah. Say this year when the last footage was shot last year. Yeah. Okay. 2011. Um, but the challenge from your perspective of telling the story and, and when the story's down and you've edited it, you feel good about the story. What, what's the challenges from your perspective to say when it's done you can feel good about it? Coming into some place that you don't live, you're not mm -hmm. from, you, I'm not saying you're an interloper, mm -hmm. but you're not from here. Mm -hmm. you know, and, I, and I know people have made you feel welcome and so forth, but is, you still feel a challenge of how do you represent the Wallacoats people? Um, I'd say strangely no, because um, I think it, it's 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 a funny thing, and and I think the, the the sort of people that know me well here, sort of you know get this in a way that you know for some reason uh, you know across the board people have quickly you know given me uh, uh, access and space and warmth and friendship that that's been been very genuine and it's not been. I, you know, in, in some respects, I think I'm because I'm not one of these Europeans that come out here with the kind of all these sort of airy fairy dreams about. So you're you know, a European, but not one of those. But I'm not one of those. That's for sure. And you know, the thing for me is that, you know, the culture out here. I mean, Lakota culture is Lakota business. It's none of my business. And you know, whenever I'm, you know, whenever I've been invited into certain spaces or things that have been sacred, like being a firekeeper or whatever. It's been totally within the respect of, I know what that means, and, and that means a lot on a very deep human level. But, but I do take it from the standpoint that, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to, to jump on anyone's culture. I'm, the, the, the thing that, you know, my connection here is human. I mean, it's, I, there are the people here I love, and I love them as individuals who just seem to collectively have a sense of humor that perfectly fills mine. And, and, um, you know, is as irreverent as mine, or mine is as irreverent as theirs, and 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 in some respects, it's been a funny thing where, you know, people have confided pretty quickly within me because in some respects, the one thing about being such an outsider—I mean, not being an American even—is 
um, is, and particularly with friends here, is I'm kind of a safe space. So, you know, people share with me things in their family and whatever because they know that it doesn't cross into, I'm not going to gossip about it elsewhere. And, um, you know, and I, and I think the thing is editorially when I was putting this together, um, you know, my biggest role was getting out of the way. So when I look at it and, you know, any, I don't look at it and say if someone challenges me for anything that's in it, it's like, well, they said it. You know, the individuals in the, in the piece. And, um, you know, I just tried to, and actually invariably with a lot of things, they weren't the only person that said what's in there, particularly historical elements, but invariably the editorial choices, you know, they may have said it the most concisely or with the best light or the best, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and I think one of the things which is interesting about it and is that, you know, it's a heavily intercut piece because it tries to really cover as much ground as possible. But invariably, you will have four people effectively speaking as one. I mean, in terms of they'll be explaining a certain thing that happened and I'll cut between them, even within the same sort of section. And, you know, in a sense, you know, there's no, there's no gap between their different perspectives on it. I think it's a really unified piece. Um, but, you know, you always put in certain things that, you know, will... I, I mean, I think as much as anything here, it's not going to be a case of what was said, it was who said it. And you're always going to get that. Somebody will resent that somebody, you know, was the person of choice to speak of it. You know, and it was funny because... You know, I remember somebody talking about it and going, oh, you know, one thing, you know, I, he just got a, f a few minutes in and he said, oh, it's a lot of Russell Means. And I said, yeah, but that's because, you know, we start with the creation story. And, you know, he was the only person of the, nine, the 70 hours or whatever that was the one that kind of concisely went through the creation story. So, you know, just from that, that's the only reason that he's there at that point when we end up talking about a lot of contemporary stuff or certain other parts of history, it's totally other people that are doing it. And um, and that's the only choice with that. So, um, you know, I think people just have to kind of sit back with some of those things and just say, well, it happened by chance that way more than anything else. Um, I mean, the stories are the stories, so, um, you know. I'm not too worried about that sort of thing because, you know, it's like with, with Razbaum, you know, it was a story I wrote in Scotland I rewrote for here, and, you know, sometimes I hear people say, oh, but, you know, there's a bit of violence and whatever in it, and it's just making the reservation look violent or whatever, and I'm like, well, it's a love story thriller, and those elements would have been in it if I shot it in Scotland as originally planned, same in Rio or in Marseille or wherever I shot it in the world. Um, and it's the same with some of the other narrative elements within it, and so you know, there, there becomes a question of whether you choose to censor something because you're doing it somewhere different. And, and to me, that's a negative. And, and what we want to be in is a world where everyone is treated equally. And so for me, I came in here, for example, with Resbaum to make a movie the exact same way I would make it anywhere else. You know, you tweak certain things for your location, but, um, you know, the basic concept's there because it's just a story about people. And I think that's why a lot of particularly young people here enjoyed it for that reason, was it was escapism in their world. Um, As a... Uh, if um, you are a, uh, say, a tribal leader, or a, an adult or elder here on Pine Ridge, <coughs> excuse me, you... Um, I've done this in, in college classes, and looked out at my students and, and realized, say, uh, something, an event like Wounded Knee, 73, and you, you look at your class and, and most of the class, by far the majority of the class, was not even born in 1973. Mm -hmm. and, and so you say, well, how do we communicate to this generation what happened at Wounded Knee? And, and it doesn't have to be, uh, for here it's Wounded Knee. Um, in, in other parts of this country, it could be Vietnam. Mm -hmm. You know, people who, who weren't alive during Vietnam, and, and yet it had a huge amount of meaning to mm -hmm. 
the entire country. So how is this a way, I mean, should do you think it should be used in high school as a curriculum or it should be used in the community college as a curriculum? Would it work in that way? If there was ever a, a, a museum visitor center at Moon Denis, could, could a, a module be set up where this showed and people want to see it? Would it represent, you know, history and, and life here? Talk about how it, well, I, I in think, what way it could be used. I, I think the, the biggest thing with it in some respects is I think that it shows the impact of all of these things. You know, it's, it's like when Custer is mentioned, for example, and the woman who mentions Custer is talking, you know, she mentions it within the context of when you read history books and you hear these people talked as, you know, savages and whatever else within the context of the bat battle with Custer, you know, she's like, and she's getting very emotional, you know, they're, they are my family, my blood family, and... and you know, and that's when it's chronologically going through those historical parts. And I think what, what really grabs the viewer, you know, outside of here is bringing it home to that. It's like when they're talking about Wounded Knee 1890. Um, you know, I mean, I, I lay the groundwork, or the, the, the people just explain what happened. But, it, you know, I mean, Wounded Knee 1890 is worthy of a feature documentary on its own, as are many segments in, in this documentary. But what I try to do in some respects is through the people explaining it is it, they convey the emotional impact it still has today on them. I mean you can even just hear it in their voices. And that's the thing is that it's about the past and the present and how the past is still present in many ways. Um, and the fact is that it, you know, because if you do something very academic, and I had no interest in doing this in an academic manner, because those academic documentaries, as fascinating as they can be and as well made as they can be, the audience has a distance. And, you know, for me, this was trying to bring the audience into my chair, the, privilege, the great privilege I've had of, of sitting before all these people. And, um, and, and it being brought home that closely. And I think that's one of the things when, when um, you know, people are studying it. I mean, I, I, and the other thing is that, you know, I heard the other day of a, a, a gentleman here who I've had the good fortune to meet a few times, walked up to one of the participants, and he'd just seen it, and he just gave her a big hug. That was his, his sort of overriding feeling from watching it, I think, because of you know, of what she'd conveyed, the emotion and the impact that these things had had. And, you know, so I think that from a community standpoint, if people listen and feel what people are saying, rather than just going, oh, such and such is saying, I don't like such and such, then I think it, it's something that can really kind of help bind people together, the fact that, you know, the people here do have this extraordinary uh, combined experience and history and, and um, you know, and help them relate to that within those other individuals. Um, so, I, you know, I, th I think that's part of the volume of it um, from an educational standpoint. Um, but, you know, when I've shown it to people who, you know, don't understand or have no knowledge really of life here, you know, people, in, people I've shown it in the UK or whatever, there's been a deep emotional connection to it, but also a sense of, you know, with, with some of the documentaries that have been done in the past, there's sort of that feeling of, um, you know, people who are kind of downtrodden, and it's kind of like people who are, who are struggling in a way, and, and the thing is, I just see really, I mean, I see a lot of really, really strong people here, and I think in the documentary, I see really strong individuals dealing with, you know, what they have to take care of and deal with, and I think that the whole journey of the narrative really allows people to see that and feel that. You know, so when they're in a house of somebody who's in a really poor housing conditions, because of the weight of the journey that got to that point, they they really can put a lot of it in context that you wouldn't by just saying watching an Al Jazeera report about contemporary housing. We're visiting with uh, Stephen Lewis Simpson. He's a filmmaker. Um, he uh, views himself as a fictional filmmaker, but he's uh, put together a, a documentary. 
um, a thunder being nation, uh, the Oglala Lakota Pine Ridge Reservation. Um, it's just being released now. He did three early films in his homeland in Scotland, and then he did uh, Res Bomb, which was a, um, a drama, and it, it could have been actually one that was set in his homeland of Scotland or in Rio de Janeiro or whatever, and he decided to make it set here in Pine Ridge. And that was released back in 2008, and now this new one was released uh, just now, uh, and originally right here in Pine Ridge, and, and will be released uh, throughout the country. Um, Stephen, you are in a unique position to have come here many times over the last 13 years. But, so I'm, I'm curious, I mean, uh, is there any, you know, the documentary is made up of a lot of different stories. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it would be good at some time, and, and what value would you see in it, to have an Oglala Lakota be a documentary filmmaker, mm -hmm. and wondering where that would go in that. I mean, does it take somebody, say, from Scotland? from outside of Pine Ridge to put together a story like this, or, you know, you mentioned that Wounded Knee could have its own documentary. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's hundreds of stories oh, that could be true. documentaries. Yeah. But we haven't done a very good job of developing Ula Lakota people who are, gain the experience or have the confidence or mm -hmm. wherewithal or can gather the resources. and. The, Talk a little bit about that. I mean, you, you represent a very unique situation. Can that same thing happen to an Oglala Lakota? Yeah, I, I, and actually, I think it's it's structured terrifically well for it here. I mean, the OLC's got everything you need. Um, although, put it in context, I mean, it, the thing about making feature films and documentaries is you need to be tenacious. You need to, for whatever reason, never look at I mean one of the things is I, I with filmmaking I would never I'll never give up it's it's just who I am and it's you a have passion yeah and uh, well it's it's just it's who I absolutely the core who I am now you look at it and you say well you know why not people here but you know you hear you have a community of about 40,000 or so or whatever however you want to crunch, crunch the numbers obviously your your listenership was far wider than that um, now, I come from a city of about a quarter of a million people, and I made my first feature there when I was 23 years old, and in history, I was the first person from my hometown to make a movie in that city. Of so, 250,000. Of 250,000. And so, you know, in, in reality, you know, there weren't scores and scores of people running around making movies. It, it, more now. Technology's made it a lot easier, and right. you know, making this documentary. I mean, completing this documentary ten years ago when I started shooting it would have been incredibly hard because I had so many different formats technically in there and archive all these sorts of things that you know even you know just advances advances in the last three four years in editing has made it a lot easier you know um, to put it all together. But you know, one of the things I'd say to people here is, for example, with Rasbon now. This is referring to purely the nuts and bolts of putting it together. It's got nothing to do with the story, whether you like it or loathe it, is irrelevant. Um, everything that costs me money on Rasbon is, um, or the va almost everything, was relating to paying people, uh, paying for locations, and supporting and putting them up. So, you know, we flew a few handful of people out, and most people were hired locally. Um, and essentially that was pretty much the majority of the expenses and there were some costs with equipment but I would buy it and sell it so it wasn't so much. Now, as I say, OLC has way more cameras and whatever else and are better set up than I am. So there's better equipment on the reservation than I had. And so if I broke down the actual out of my pocket costs to have made that movie, if I used exclusively friends and family that I had here, and I used locations and things that belonged to relatives and whatever else. It would have just been a case of, you know, five bucks here, fifteen bucks there for the handful of props that were needed, and feeding people. And, you know, let's face it, everyone gets their meals a day anyway, so they take, you know, you can figure it out. So in, in reality, there was not really much of a fundamental cost beyond that, other than 
time and effort and you know I put in you know with a, in terms of Rasbom I probably put in about two and a half years of work on it I spent about a year and a half developing it previously when I was trying to get it made in the UK and you know everyone you know the only person who never actually made a dime out of on Rasbom was myself I'm the only, I, I didn't pay myself but everyone else was paid and um, but you know, and the other thing is that, you know, there's this very small market for um, films from Indian country if they're direct distributed into Indian country, but it's big enough that if somebody here who's really inspired to do it um, put something together that was watchable, that they could cover their costs on it plus if they then took it out to, you know, some of the wholesalers that pass it on to companies that sell the powwows and things like that. Um, I mean, it's it's you know it's not a lot of money, but it's enough that they could you know they could make a little cottage industry out of it if people wanted to watch it and cover their costs. So I think it really does come down to the individuals. Although when it comes to this documentary, um, I think the danger of somebody local here doing it in terms of getting the same you know cross section of people in it is it's just sort of that that thing here of, oh, you're, you know, you're such and such as kid, I don't really get on with them so much, so I don't know if I want to say so much, or whatever. And, and, and in some respects, it's the, you know, it's the thing I said earlier, it's for some reason, if, if only people here treated each other the way I was treated here, you know, because um, I, I, you know, I've not really had m pretty much any bad experience with anyone here at all, and I've had scores and scores of wonderful ones. Um, so, yeah. Where do you go from here as far as you have projects in the opera, I imagine? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a strange time because, you know, I, I literally finished the documentary in May, and normally you send it around festivals and whatever, do festivals maybe for a year before you put it out on DVD. And I didn't want to wait. I didn't want to wait for anyone to see it. So I had the DVDs back from the manufacturer a week after it was finished, and hit the road to come out here and uh, and you know I'm running around here getting it you know whenever I'm, tr I'm trying to meet up with the people that were in it and, and to give them all copies and the um, but on the road out here uh, I drove from LA and I kind of came the long way I went through the south and then up to Bemidji and Minnesota and then down to uh, Mill Lax and what I was doing was I flew this Alaska native guy, Martin Sensmar, um, down, and, and some of you might know of Martin. He's uh, many things, but one of the things is he's a model, and um, there's a lot of ladies in particular been drooling over this photo of him with a huge golden eagle in his hand that's been doing the rounds on Facebook, and um, he's pretty well known. Um, and I would, wanted to pitch in a series, which I'm in the process of doing, to There's a new TV channel, First Nations Experience, out of California, um, was to set up a magazine show for television, a recurring thing set throughout an Indian country, covering a lot of the wonderful things that people are doing in the creative fields. And, and so we went on this trip, and we just did it, you know, very spontaneously, and, and within our sort of 10 days on the road, we in the promo I put together for it, we've got Chris Ayer, we've got Adam Beach, we've got Ryan Redcorn, Stephen Paul Judd, Larry Price, um, you know, a bunch of other people, and and who we, you know, Anthony Tosh Collins, I mean, a lot of people we just encountered on the road, and um, you know, so fingers crossed that's something that could be picked up because, you know, it's sort of that big thing with, you know, we're in such a you know, really a vacuous media age in terms of what is being put forward in terms of, you know, a role model now is based on fame and nothing else. But within that, within that culture, you know, when do you ever see a face from Indian country on TV? And so for young people, it's like they're just not being represented in any form. So what the plan was with this series is to totally reverse that, have this show that you can plug into, and you're just seeing really wonderful, talented, dynamic individuals doing really, really cool things that just all happen to be, you know, from different tribes around the country. And, to, you know, for it to be something that's entertaining but also has that drip-drip effect of inspiring people to see, 
you know, their own the possibilities that, that, you know, there is room for maneuver for them to try and move forward in their careers and, and with things they want to do creatively. So that's kind of one thing. And the other thing is I'm running around doing location scouting because um, we're trying to get off the ground a feature film adaptation of Kent Nurburn's um, fabulous novel Neither Wolf Nor Dog, which uh, came out in the mid-90s. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of, um, you know, over the years various people have been trying to get it made into a movie. Um, the, you know, one or two quite you know, prominent people out in L.A., but they were always kind of trying to go for it and kind of go for the big bucks with it and whatever else. Um, but also it was becoming a bit, you know, they were pushing a bit down to the Hollywood road narratively. And um, I bumped into Kent at a screening I did of Razbaum in out in the area here, and he gave me the novel, and we really hit it off, and I liked the script as well. And, um, you know, so we're just doing what we can to try and get that made, but I, when I got the script, it was funny because I, I pulled out a number of scenes and when he reread it, he was amazed because everything I pulled out was things that this Hollywood director had asked to be put in. And so, you know, he was just really impressed that, you know, any, that, that I was so sensitive to false notes um, in terms of authenticity. And so the big conundrum with it, in a way, at the moment, is um, casting. Because for those of you out there that, have, that know the novel, um, it centers around an eight-year-old Lakota man called Dan, and um, you know it's not an easy role to fill. It's a major role, and um, you know unless somebody out there has the power of resurrection, then we can resurrect Chief Dan George. That's just yeah. exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's been a quest. I mean, it's you know, and I think one of the things which is crucial to me, and and, and you know what's very important is. You know, it's not even just an age thing. You know, you can find people in their mid-70s who feel old but contemporary. And, you know, some of these individuals that then, sadly, there aren't many left around, who just energetically, and they're, they're just from a different time. They still resonate from that to a different time. And, um, and so that's kind of crucial to us. So, you know, the idea of getting one of the well-established actors out there and just sort of aging, aging them a bit, to me, you know, would scream of being a false note. And so, you know, that's the biggest stumbling block we've got. I mean, we've still got money to raise and whatever. No, who wrote the book? Kent Nurburn. And Kent's, you know, written quite a few uh, books over the years. And, um, you know, it... it it was interesting, after I read the book, but before I read the script, I was out here and um, and I was chatting with Leon Matthews, and he was saying, have you ever read Neither, Neither Wolf Nor Dog? And I was like, yeah. And he says, you know, best book ever written about Indian country by a white guy. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And... Um, and then I, I... And then as we went around, and the funny thing is that there's some kind of few quite prominent supporters that we have really encouraging us and helping us along the way to get this made. Every single one is from Indian country. And, and you know, some people in pretty prominent aspects of life. And, uh, and so, you know, that's pretty encouraging. Did Nervern write this, the screenplay or script as well? He did. And, and what's interesting about it is one of the things when I talk to people about it, because with Kent, we, we had a, took a road trip in the summer of last year pretty much following the journey of um, the characters in the book. And one of the three central characters is kind of based on him. It's sort of semi-autobiographical around people he knew and experiences he had. And, um, and it was interesting. I took him to meet some individuals who were similar to the characters. Like, there was this really fabulous old-timer in uh, Cheyenne River that I took him to meet. And it was really interesting appreciating the difference between a white white American and a white European in a room with a Lakota elder in a way. And Kent is somebody who goes into any space with a great deal of respect and admiration and whatever, but he, he's very conscious of a sort of historical context and whatever. Whereas, you know, I just go in with, uh, you know, having had 
years of experience of just having a wonderful, fun, you know, I always go in with a real lightness, whereas he's aware that there's a sort of shadow on the wall of history. And so I got to see his, how his body language was and all those other things in that space. And the thing is that a white Midwestern filmmaker from a similar world to him would have missed that, I think. And a Lakota filmmaker would have missed that as well. And so with a combination of my experience here with also being an outsider lets me really see that dance between the two worlds. And, um, you know, which is really fascinating. You know, it's, it's really kind of extraordinary to see. Um, and so, you know, I feel pretty confident about that aspect of it. But the other funny thing is that, and it's sort of something that I kind of mentioned to a few people out here, is the difference between, uh, you know, when people here go to the border towns and they often feel, you know, an unfriendliness to say the least in terms of the dynamic and attention and all those other things. I mean, I found it before, you know, I go to a steakhouse in Kadoka coming back here and the whole time I'm there I just feel like an outsider, you know, and, and it's not the most friendly of places. You know, and then, and then later that night I roll down to Wombly and I end up driving into a camp being set up by, um, actually Derek, who works here, was setting up, it was the first time I met him, where they were setting up for the 100 for mile ride. And I didn't know anyone that was there, but I instinctively knew that when I drove into the camp, you know, uh, chances are I would be welcomed and I'd be welcomed at the far and then and it was happy, it would be fine for me to camp there as it was and we were having a wonderful time in the fireplace sort of 60 seconds after me rolling in. And so, you know, as an external individual to this whole country, you know, I can really appreciate both of those elements. You know, because if I was if I was Lakota and I was in that steakhouse, I was just I would just assume they're probably purely racist. But there's also that level of kind of insular aspects to some of those communities as well. And um, and 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 that that's the crazy thing is that you know they just you f you feel you go in a lot of these places and they just view you from the outside. You're an outsider. Whereas as a European, you come in here. And you always get that feeling, and, and I've experienced this more even in this last trip all through Indian, a lot of Indian country, is that the first that you just get judged purely as an individual in Indian country pretty quick, you know, because that's the thing. I, I don't get judged as a white guy walking in the room when they look at me and they go, "Oh no, you're cool," and and it's like you're cool. It's not associated with anything else. Just you as an individual, and that's why I have such a great time. And and you know, I think that's just such a great quality. I don't know if you relate to that so much, because obviously you're an American, you know. Um, or whether I've just been lucky. Um, you've met the, the writer of the book, and you've seen the screenplay or script, and you're, you're looking. Does that mean that if you find the money and the resources, you're going to do this film? Yeah, I mean, I, in some respects, I think it's not a complicated film to put together. So I think, you know, if you know, if push comes to shove, when we shoot it for, we can shoot it for for, for not that much if we have to. Um, I mean, one of these years, it would be nice to actually walk away with a paycheck because it's hard treading water all these years. Sure. But, but. Um, but, you know, we'll try and do it whichever way. I actually, my bigger concern is actually getting a great dad, is getting this great 80-year-old Lakota guy. That's that's my sort of biggest thing. I and mean, once we've got that, then... That's the biggest hurdle. Yeah, because I think, you know, there's there's an, we have enough interest from people around who want to see this get made that we'll, we'll figure it out one way or another. Um, and I think the interesting thing about it is that one of the things that's been articulated a lot... Um, you know, by supporters of the book, is that it really uh, goes re to great depths as explaining the Lakota narrative to the outside world. I mean, the authors had stories of, like, uh, you know, American Indian inmates in prisons buying the book to give to the prison wardens and say, "You have to read this to understand this." That's just pretty incredible, and. Um, you know, 
Whereas my claim to fame is that apparently in the jail right by White Clay, <laughs> res, res bombs being shown a lot there. So that's my claim to fame, and in, in, uh, you know, which is which is nice to hear, but especially considering we filmed in that jail. So this new film documentary, mm -hmm. uh, Thunder Being Nation, the uh, Ogla Lakota Pine Ridge Reservation, it's available where. Well, so far, we, we started getting it in some stores, and I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Um, the store in Oglala, um, Big Bats has got a bunch. And, and actually, if you try in Big Bats, because they bought a bunch last week, but I was in there on Friday, and they hadn't put them out yet. So if you don't see them out, ask, because um, um, they, it's like Resbom they've had there for ages, but they haven't had it out. So apparently nobody knows they've had it. I mean, they, they sold very well there to begin with, but then they haven't been advertising it. Um, the store in Wombly uh, have actually, they had some, but they just phoned me this morning, they sold out, so I'll be getting some more there hopefully later today or... Sioux Nation of here? Not yet, because there's a different guy who handles their books or stuff, so hopefully we'll get it in there. Um, the store in Batesland has it, um, Prairie Edge in Rapid has it, Turtle Creek Crossing in Rosebud has a bundle. Uh, the Arts and Crafts store in Mission has it, um, Pinkies has it, uh, Singing Horse just north of Manderson has it, and um, they have a few at the uh, Motel in Kyle. Um, Prairie Ranch. Prairie Ranch. Well, I don't know if they got them out. Um, and. Um, I got to. I've just got to speak to Angel. Hopefully, Angels will have and and Kyle because she she did well with Resbomb. So I'm, I'll try and get it wherever we can. Okay. And, and, and you know anyone can find. So me will online. it be distributed nationally and internationally as well? Well, I mean it's it's available online. I've my my I have a shop uh, inyoentertainment.com forward slash shop. That's I N inyo entertainment dot com. That's I N Y O entertainment and then forward slash shop. Um, you can find it there. Um, the documentary's on Facebook with our page, and you, also on the Rasbon page on Facebook and Twitter. You'll, you'll find the details. Um, uh, it's sort of expanding from there. Um, there's some stores in Navajo and some others that have got it that I've had relationships with. It's just kind of rolling it out because ordinarily you would get it all organized and then send it out at once, but because I didn't want to wait getting it out, partly because of trying to set up this next film and all these other things. It just it's it's all being done ad hoc. But um, if if people on Twitter can find me at Razbomb, um, uh, or on Facebook uh, for the pages of the films, and if anyone knows of any other stores that uh, would be interested in carrying it, they can contact us there. I mean I'll try and get it up to the main store in Eagle Butte. They sold a bundle of Raz bombs and um, I've just got to try and do the rounds with it. Anything else you want to say in conclusion? Uh, I could talk forever, so that's a that. bad question. <laughs> but it's always a delight to be here. Okay. I thank you very much. Thank you. We've been visiting with Stephen Lewis Simpson, who is a filmmaker. He uh, uh, released Res Bomb back in 2008, a story that could have been anywhere, but he's set right here in Pine Ridge. Um, and now in 2012, in fact, just in May of this year, he completed a documentary. He's not usually a documentarian, but it just called out to him. A Thunder Being Nation, the Ogla Lakota Pine Ridge Reservation. Um, it's available. It's a, How much is it? Dep it depends on what the stores are selling it for. The, the, the special edition typically goes for around 20 and the ultimate about 25, which is the 10 hours of extras. Okay. And you can get it. That's uh, the Pine Ridge prices. Lakota prices are cheaper than online, by the way. Okay. Because I always discount it locally. So, but it's available in, in Oglala, in Pine Ridge, at Big Bats, in Wombly, in Batesland, Prairie Edge, in Rapid City, 6th and Main. Um, it's also uh, Turtle Creek Crossing in Rose and Mission Town. Um, it's at the Arts and Crafts Store in Mission. Um, it's also at Pinkies and Singing Horse Trading Post, north of Manderson, and um, Prairie Ranch. Uh, resort and restaurant as well. You can uh, go online at Inyo Entertainment, I-N-Y-O Entertainment forward slash shop. Yeah. And uh, you can order.
order it that way and, and buy it that way. Um, I thank Steve very much for coming, and I'm sure we'll see him in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Send it over and back to Derek Janice here at Portfine View. You're listening to Key Lee. FM Radio, the voice of this great Lakota nation. Coming up shortly will be uh, the Ogallah Sioux Tribal President's Office with, uh, I'm not sure if it's just Donald Solomon or it will be uh, Tribal President John Yellowbird Steele. But they'll be up next. Stay tuned here on Keeley FM Radio. The coolest thing you can ever say to me is, do you want to talk some more?